uh, Ashley said, I grew up in this church. Um, my dad's an elder at this church. They've sat in that seat for the past 100 years. So um, as you know, we, uh, it's been kind of uh, a mark on my life. And so I'm very blessed for that and uh, just very thankful. Um, but yeah, 20 years Kirk and Nikki have been here. Um, I think that's a statement to how faithful God is and how faithful he has been with that family. Um, and how amazing that is for that, this church. Um, Jesus Center has made a mark not only on my life, but on, I would say, the whole city assessor. Um, Kirk and Nikki, you know them. You know their hearts. You know the people they are. Um, and I'm just very, very blessed to have them here and have them uh, working for God. And so just very, very thankful for them. Um, and yes, I am not Kirk. Um, I am much younger, um, a lot easier on the eyes. Um, so honestly, that's a blessing too. So um, I, I can say those things. He's a little bit scared of me. So I, you know, I, I wouldn't repeat those things to him, but you know, I, I kind of get a pass. Yeah. So yeah, just I wouldn't say those things if I was, you know, you or anything, but I can say them. But yeah, um, my name is Luke Thompson. My wife is over there. Our, our first kid, he's one month old. He's with his Mimi right there, the one with the light red hair like mine. So um, we are very excited and blessed um, with him. Uh, he has just been amazing. Uh, I do want to talk about a little bit of the process of how he got here of, okay, we are at the you know hospital, we are there, and no one can really give you a good image of what's gonna go on, especially for the father. You know, the women, they talk about, oh, you wanna hear my, you know, how my birth went and everything, and I think a lot of us fathers just tone it out, because you don't even wanna think about it, because like, you're not really experiencing it, you're just watching it, and I think that's way scarier to me. Um, and so, as this is happening, you know, no, like the nurses and doctors come in and they don't tell you anything. They don't even know you're there. And so they're like getting you ready and, or getting her ready. And they're like, all right, go. And then the baby's here. And you're just like, I, I don't even know if I asked for this, you know, it's, and then they're trying to hand you the baby. I'm like, he's kind of gross right now. I don't. And they're like, yeah, but he's yours. And I'm like, uh, okay. And so I, I'm like, my wife did amazing. She pushed him out in like 10 minutes. And I was like, is this hourly? Like, how much is this going to cost me? Like, you know, I, I didn't really know all what was going to go on. Um, but in the end, we did keep him. And so, yeah, he's living with us now. Um, and I don't think it's a rental. So that's, that's really good to know. And uh, so, yeah, but yeah, we like him. So, yeah. But uh, no, his name is Woods William Thompson, and so very, very blessed to be his father, experiencing my first Father's Day. Um, just to know a little bit more about me, so um, my job, I work for DCFS. I am what they call a child welfare specialist, and basically it's a fancy word for social worker. Um, I work with families and children in the middle of brokenness. So the family got broken up, and I'm there to try to help find permanency um, a forever family for that child. And that's either with their biological family or that's with somebody else. And so when you're getting put in the middle of that, it's hectic, it's wild. And these, these families, there's always a consistency. Normally, they're not married. Normally, um, they don't have a lot of supports. Normally, they don't have a consistent job. But the th same thing every single time, they are far from God. They do not have that in their lives. And as a DCFS worker, I do my best to pray about each family that I have and see where God can lead me and see where God can put me in their lives to point them back at Him. And it's not easy because not everyone accepts that. And when I was getting into the world of social work, I, didn't ne I never knew I wanted to do that. Um, my sister Janae and brother-in-law Marcus, they've been doing it for a lot of years. And they've told, they told me when I was kind of looking for a new job, they were saying, you'd be great at this. You'd be really great. What I come to figure out is there are job shortages in social work every single time. So I don't know if I, they thought I'd actually be good if they just wanted the, you know, a little help there. So end up going into that. 
And uh, I think God really put a mission on my heart for the family and for children. And so um, I can actually say I like my job. I enjoy it because I know I have a purpose there. And um, I'm very blessed that God gave me that. Um, and it's not an easy job to enjoy. Um, and I, I, I really do. I really do enjoy it and feel very blessed to have my position. Um, and so today I want to talk about the importance of a father and uh, the importance of not only your biological father, but God, the father. Um, and so I want to give you some statistics. Um, it's from John Sowers. It's called from the book of The Fatherless Generation. And so this is children from fatherless homes. So there's no home in the, there's no father in their home. They don't have a, a dad that is, you know, leading them, leading the household. And so these are the following statistics. 63% of children from fatherless homes account for 63% of youth suicides, 70% 70 of juvenile in-state operated institutions, 71% of all high school dropouts, 71% of pregnant teenagers, 75% of all adolescents and substance abuse centers, 80% of rapists motivated with displaced anger, 85% of all youth who exhibit behavior disorders, 85% of all youth sitting in prison, and 90% of all homeless and runaway teenagers. That's the importance of a father. And these statistics, they hit home. They're real. We know people that have had to deal with these. The family is being broken more than just in the life of DCFS. The family is being broken everywhere. It's not something that people tell you you need to do. Often when things get hard, they tell you to break it. Um, Robbie Lowe wrote an article in Touchstone where he explains, in 1994, the Swiss carried out an extra survey that the researchers for our masters in Europe were happy to record. The question was asked to determine whether a person's religion carried through the next generation, and if so, why or why not? The result is dynamite. There is one critical factor. It is overwhelming, and it is this. It is the religious practice of the father of the family that above all determines the future attendance at or absence from the church of the children. Fathers, you're the leaders in your family. The way you lead your family determines where your children are spending eternity. That's heavy. Michael Foster writes, the spiritual benefits of fatherhood for the father are many, but here are two to consider. Being a father allows you to see your sins more clearly as your children reflect them back to you in their attitudes and actions. Being a father helps you see the father's love for you as you experience this intense drive to protect and nurture your children. The father's showing us how to be, how to be fathers, how important our role is of the father as he is the father. So today, um, I want to give a story of uh, the parable of the prodigal son, where we see Jesus is telling it um, to the Pharisees. And so a lot of us, if we grew up in church or we've been in church for many years, we've heard this story. And so it's going to be very familiar for you. And I, I really want to just reflect on the story of it um, and just kind of break it down on what uh, it means to the father, the son, and everyone um, just kind of a part of this story. So. Uh, we'll start off with verse 11. Um, and so it said, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. So reckless living is something that none of us can deny. It's a sinful life. Reckless living um, looks differently for all of us. Um, I would say not two of us have had the same reckless living. Um, but it's a, it's a sinful life, and that's the destination for all of us without God. And so we see the son. The son was prideful and selfish. We see in his actions that he didn't go to the far country to you know, start a family, start a business, you know, change his life. Um, and he insisted, insisted to live sinfully and for himself. We, we all got some prodigal son in us. We all want that sinful life 
and there's those temptations in, all, in us. And so in the story, it's interesting to see that the father in the story does not ask the son why he wants to do this. He just gives it to him. We just see that the son comes, to, all we know in the story is the son comes to the father, says, I want my inheritance, and the father just gives it to him. The father doesn't ask, you know, what is he going to do with this money? Where is he going? The father just fulfills the request of the son. I think oftentimes when we pray, asking things from God, do we expect him to ask questions of us? Do we expect him to ask us what this prayer will do for us? What, where are we going to go with the things we are requesting? Or do we expect him to just fulfill our prayers? God knows how these requests will play out, but he gives them to us. Many times we've asked these prayers and God is a good father. He wants to attend to his children. He wants to show love to his children. And many times I've had prayers answered that didn't fulfill me, that didn't make me better in any way. And so knowing the destruction that these requests will often lead us, we often will push. But in this part right here, patience is a gift. And impatience, impatience will often lead us to destruction. As a father, there's nothing more than we want to fulfill than all of the requests of our children. To make sure they have a life filled of happiness and joy, but we all know we can never give them complete fulfillment. There's nothing we can personally give our children that will make them forever content. And so as we read on to verse 14, and it said, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. So a lot of us have hit rock bottom. That's why a lot of us maybe be in church, because we know, knew, know, we had nowhere else to look. And so, but not a lot of us have been looking at pig slop and been saying, I want to eat that. You know, I am so starving that I need to eat that. And the son, he had no one to blame but himself. He, he chose this, and he, uh, he may have been tempted into sin, but only can he decide if he will pursue it. And I think the story here, or the point here is, a life full of temptations is not sinful. A life fulfilling our temptation leads to death. That's what we see with the son. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. To live a forgiven life, you must first acknowledge that you have sinned. We all fall short of the kingdom of heaven and we all must repent. We see the son have his breakdown, and where does his mind go? The father. My father can help me. My father can pull me out of this. My father will save me. When we get into the parts of our lives where we don't know where to go, where, where do we go? Where does our heart lead us? Where does our mind go? Um, I know for me, if I don't know what to do something, and that's 99% of the time, um, I call my dad and I say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, and I'm very confused on this. And he'll be like, okay. And one, he either has the answer or two, he's going to find out the answer for me. And that's great to have. And I wish everyone had that, but we don't. And my dad can't give me everything. My dad can't fulfill all of my questions and my answers. And my, my father can't make me content. My father can't answer all my prayers. He'll try, but he can't. And so uh, the parable shows the great difference between death and life. We see the son looking for a life with the father. And then later on, we see another person that can't get past his sin in the book of Luke. His name was Judas. He couldn't get past to what he did sin. And so instead of him going and repenting, he chose to take his own life. And to look back on that, you know it, it broke Jesus' heart. You know it broke God's heart. To know that 
They were there. They were there to love him. Yes, he did a terrible thing, but God is never far. God is close. And so on 20, we see, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. The father is not naive to the sins of the son, because most of the time, us as fathers, we've dealt with the same sins as our sons. The fathers know where the son has traveled. The father knows the reckless living. Still, the father chose compassion and love. It wasn't just enough to watch the son walk back to the home. Uh, we see the father ran and kissed him. We have to show this grace to our children so they know the true grace of Christ. I think a lot of times Jesus puts things in our lives to see if, how we will react, how we will treat others, how we will treat our own kids. Because if we can't show the love of Christ to our kids, who will? Who, how will they experience God? Yes, we can come to church every day and... I know Jesus Center well. I know it's a good church. They will experience God here. But when times get tough in their home, who is showing them Christ day in and day out? And the Holy Spirit, it'll show itself. We know it will. But it's not always easy to see. You know what's easy to see? Compassion from a father. Grace of a father. Love of a father. A kid knows when their father loves them. We're in my line of work, even when kids don't have good fathers, they still love them. Even when their, their father hasn't treated them well, the kids still want to be with them. Because at one point, they remembered when their dad loved them. It wasn't just enough, or sorry, and I, and I think there's symbolization going on when the father tells the servants, get his son the best robe a ring and his shoes. Just because the son leaves his father's kingdom does not make him a slave when he comes back. The son is still a part of the kingdom. You will never out God's grace. You will never out God's love. You will never out God's faithfulness. There is nothing we can do to make God turn our back on us, all right? There is nothing we can do. God will always be where he is at. He will always be with open arms. It is our choice if we get to run towards him. You're never too far lost for where God won't accept you in the kingdom. God will always celebrate you coming back. You are never too far gone. So on 25 we see, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property, who with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him? And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The story could have ended at verse 24. But Jesus made this point because there's others like the older brother. The brother deserves his celebration. And we'll get our celebration. Our celebration isn't the same on earth that it will be in heaven. Um, we see that the son stuck close to the father. The so father had no fear of losing the son. The father knew where the son was at. He knew the older brother was there in his home. The older brother knew that anything that he wanted of his father, that it was his. When the dead are brought back to life, that is a celebration. We must celebrate our brothers and sisters who were lost but are now found, dead but are now alive. We must make it known to everyone because there are billions just like them. 
Christianity isn't something that is um, being accepted more and more. It's actually the quite opposite. It's a, it's a declining faith in America. Um, and often now, it's a religion being made fun of online. It's a religion saying um, it's racist, um, homophobic, things of this nature. Um, where will we fight back as fathers? Because the question is, if we don't fight for our children, who will? The main part of this parable Jesus was teaching us was the compassion of the Father. The same compassion that, be, that is being shown here is the same compassion that we receive day in and day out from the Lord. Being a f husband and a father is not just something we get to do. It is a divine calling and should be treated as such. We are living in a society that neglects the family and often trying to do, it, do away with it completely. Um, the White House and government, or whatever you want to call it, they ran an ad um, that basically said, these are our children, calling our children their children. And at no point is our children the government's children. And we must protect that. And as fathers, we have to be in the front lines of that protection. And that's the importance of a father. The father must protect. The father must shield. The father must teach and show what is right. The father must teach the Bible to their kids so their kids know, so they can teach their kids. Generations and generations. Fathers are pivotal to keeping the family together. Fathers, lead your families. Fathers, show up in your church. Fathers, be like the father. And some of you might be, I don't even know how to start to be like the father. Well, here's one great way. Read the Bible. And you might say, I don't, I don't understand that's everything that's in there. That's okay. That's fine. You read it and you ask questions. There's people in this church that would love to answer those questions. Uh, there's leaders in this church that would love to answer those questions. Those people will sit down with you and explain those things. Explain what God is doing in your life or what God is trying to show you. That's a blessing. That is a huge thing for a church to have. Another thing is to pray. Pray and ask the Father, how can I be better? Because a Father is just not His presence. It's not just He's there and it, it works. No, a Father is showing out what the Father does for us. Are we being compassionate in our lives? Are we loving people? Um, when we leave and go home, our, when those doors close, how are we treating our wives? How are we treating our families? How are we treating our children? That's where it starts. It has to start in the home. It has to start with the family. It has to start with us. There's some questions that I want to reflect on as we wrap up today. Am I the father my kids need? Am I the father that I needed while growing up? When, am I, when I am parenting, am I reflecting Christ? We have a lot of young people in this church, and the heaviness, importance of finding a husband that is a good father is true and it's real. Um, we have a lot of young men in this that need the reflection of a good father to show them what a true father is. Um, there's so much stuff being spewed out online, and um, you couldn't. I, I would. I should have brought a statistic of what the amount of content kids are getting now um, through YouTube, TikTok, whatever you want to call it. It's unbelievable what things they are being told and. It's even if you wanted to monitor all of it, you couldn't. Um, and so it, it's a thing we have to watch. It's a thing we have to know. If you want to be a good father, know your kids. Live out and know the father. I want to thank you guys for just giving me an opportunity to speak, and I'll pray and end this today. Father, just thank you so much um, for your love, your compassion, your grace. I pray that as we go out, um, I pray that our wives encourage us to be good fathers. Our church encourages us to be good fathers. And I pray when times get hard, we look towards you. You will lead us, Father. We know that you are the most important father to turn our eyes to. I pray that when we pray, we surrender. Um, and we just, we just thank you again, Father. We thank you and we love you. Amen.